everybody has a favorite dinosaur, and I'm no exception. Which, honestly, really shouldn't be a surprise to you. The ones that are well known to the general populace are birds, followed quickly by, you know, the stereotypical dinosaurs like T-Rex and Triceratops, and then a bunch of things that aren't really dinosaurs, but people don't really understand that they're not dinosaurs, you know, like uh, pteranodons and mosasaurs, and some people say like saber-toothed tigers. Huh. Having a favorite dinosaur is no different than having a favorite animal. But there's this extra element of them being basically fantasy creatures, you know, kind of like dragons, because they're all extinct. Well, except for birds. So today, we're going to talk about my favorite dinosaur. But it also gives me a chance to talk about tangentially related things. So grab a snack, sit back, and relax as I take you on a journey to the early Cretaceous. You know what? We're going to do that quite literally. Welcome to the Cretaceous. Well, not exactly. Um, this is the Glenrose Formation, which was in the Cretaceous, somewhere around the ballpark of 100 to 120 million years ago. Around that time in history, this all out here would have been the shorelines of an ancient ocean, uh, the Western Interior Seaway which at one point would come to completely separate the western and eastern sides of the United States in two, into Laramidia on the west and Appalachia in the east. Technically where we are today is called Dinosaur Valley State Park here in Glen Rose, Texas. It's a wonderful place. All that cool stuff back there. Look at, I mean like there's that right there. It's like an amphitheater. You can go and sit and I'm getting sidetracked, but this is a really cool place. And where we were not too terribly long ago, up that way, holds something really cool. The Glen Rose Formation is famous for a whole bunch of different fossils. And it's mostly because of this stuff right here, limestone. This area used to be, at one point in time, a really, really flourishing shoreline with lagoons, coral reefs, all of the above. And so you'll find out here a number of shells that are fossilized, things like mussels and uh, clams and all of those kinds of things but you'll also find out here fossilized coral reefs entire uh, in their entirety which is what these limestone formations that are making up the walls of this very sheer cliff which I'm not sure if you can actually see beside me but it makes us up but it's not the most famous fossils out here now as can be seen by my shift back to being here in my room on site Momo couldn't really film in front of what he wanted to for extended periods of time. Who would have guessed that a state park on a weekend in March would be as crowded as it was. N not to mention that the area of interest was incredibly small and only had one way in or out of it, uh, assuming that, you know, you didn't want to climb a sheer cliff face or go for a swim and that's our way to and fro <laughs> oh this is gonna be fun and since i am back here allow me to make some small addendums because apparently i can't remember my scripts well enough when i'm quickly trying to film something the types of fossils that can be found in dinosaur valley and the Glen Rose formation in general are the coral limestones shelled creatures like clams, mussels, and ammonites, all the way up to large dinosaurs. Getting back on track, the most famous fossils there are these, um, fossilized trackways. Uh, no, I did not take this from the site. This, this, this is a very nice replica. Now, actually, the trackways look something more like this. The larger ones of them are made by a sauropod, most likely Sauroposidon, which is one of the fossilized dinosaurs that have been found in the area. The smaller ones, which you almost certainly recognize as dinosaur tracks, you know, they're the ones with the that look like the, the rock. Uh, well, those are far more important to the topic of 
my favorite dinosaur. Those tracks were made by a fairly large theropod dinosaur. And when it comes to large theropods of the Americas, I'm willing to bet that you're familiar with at least a few. And that at least at some point in your lifetime, you've confused all of them with Tyrannosaurus rex. I don't fault you for that. No, instead I blame the American educational system and every faulty reconstruction of large theropods that tried to use the name of T-Rex in order to catch your attention. But the T-Rex is way too young to actually have made these footprints in particular, only having existed 72 to 66 million years ago. The fact that there's almost as much time between you and T-Rex as there is between T-Rex and this animal should give you a sense of how young it was in comparison. And that's not even taking into consideration that it's not related to the dinosaur that did make them. And then there's Allosaurus, which is closer to the target. And the problem with Allosaurus is that it's way too old, at around 145 million years ago in the late Jurassic. You could almost imagine it as our mystery dinosaur's great-great-great-uncle. More recently, you would have been made aware of Giganotosaurus from series like Jurassic World or the Ark Survival Games, but it has two issues. It's younger at around 95 million years ago, and it's on the completely wrong continent. South America was not connected to North America until after the end of the Cretaceous Extinction Event, which I did talk about briefly here. Anyways, but Giganotosaurus is closer than either of the other two animals that we've already talked about in terms of relationship. A, a younger cousin, if you would. Our subject of interest today is a dinosaur that you've almost certainly never heard of, unless you're really into dinosaurs or you've had an extended conversation with me. Finally, he's done beating around the bush! Allow me to introduce you to my favorite dinosaur, Acrocanthosaurus atakensis. This animal's name literally translates into high-spined lizard, and it was called that for the large neural spines that went all the way down its back. In life, it would have resembled either a small sail or a hump, as illustrated by this beautiful meme. It was around 35 foot in length, stood 13 foot at the hips, and weighed between 4 and 7 metric tons. All of this while being spread across the majority of the United States, east of Colorado. But... And that's all information that you can actually probably find just looking at the Wikipedia for the dinosaur. There's two things really that make it my favorite dinosaur. The first is that it comes from my home state of Texas, and the other is that it sits in near obscurity in the public eye. People will look at this dinosaur in the museums with all the plaques and everything, and they'll still call it one of the three other dinosaurs that we talked about earlier. Or they'll be standing next to the footprints of it and say, wow, look at them T-Rex footprints. Well, you know, it just, it goes on and on and on. You, you can't imagine my heartbreak the other day when I was talking to my grandfather and he just started going off on this tangent about T-Rex in Texas. T-Rex never lived in Texas. It was in Laramidia. The western part of the United States, separated by an entire sea. <sighs> so, let's dig into the details of Acrocanthosaurus. Get it? Dig? It's a paleontology joke. And am I the only one laughing at that? Uh... Anyways, just to lay some ground rules, I'm not going to talk in detail about the anatomical structure of the dinosaur, mostly because I think that would be really boring. I mean, like, showing figure after figure of fossil bones and their placement on the dinosaur seems like it wouldn't really keep your attention for very long. But if you are interested into those kind of things, uh, there is a wonderful YouTube channel that does talks all about reconstructions and how they are perceptions of dinosaurs change over the years. It's called Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong. Uh, they did a video about uh, Giganotosaurus re uh, not too terribly long ago, 
and there are some mentions about Acrocanthosaurus in it, so it wouldn't be a bad follow-up video to this one, and I will have the links down in the description. Acrocanthosaurus is a large, non-avian theropod from the later stages of the early Cretaceous. To most people, that's going to sound like a bunch of mumbo-jumbo. Don't worry, we will cover what most of that means a little later. It was first discovered near Atoka, Oklahoma in the 1940s, which is where it gets its species name from. That discovery was of two largely incomplete skeletons, and they weren't officially described until the 1950s. For those of you who don't know, a description in the world of paleontology would be when a skeleton or bone has been fully analyzed, classified, and sorted in a way that gives us a baseline understanding of what the creature was or what the function of that bone was. In most cases, a species isn't described with a complete skeleton. That's mostly because complete or near-complete skeletons are incredibly hard to find. In the case of Acrocanthosaurus, we have no complete skeletons, and it wasn't until the 1980s that we actually had a complete skull for the animal. That discovery gave us the most complete skeleton that we have for Acrocanthosaurus, and it's only about 50% complete, or maybe just a little over. But the total amount of incomplete skeletons and fragmentary remains of the animal that we do have makes for a near-complete understanding of it. I want to be incredibly clear on this. That is the standard for most of the things in the world of paleontology. Now, earlier I said in no uncertain terms that Acrocanthosaurus was not related to the tyrant lizard king. That's... That's Tyrannosaurus Rex, if, uh, if, if you don't catch that. But I did say that it was related to those other two, one of which is on a completely different continent. So let's explain that. And what better way to do that than with a visual aid? I made this phylogeny tree after looking at a good number of others online and deciding that I just needed to make my own because everyone else uses a WebP file and uh, they just just use JPEGs from now on, please, okay? Now, in reality, each and every one of these branches should look like the Silurosuria branch way down here. And all of them do have names, but I did this by hand, and I'm way too lazy to go through and put every name and every branch on this. It would end up looking like a jumbled mass of just black ink if I did that. All of that is just to say that there is probably something wrong, but the majority of details are correct enough for our purposes. Just as an example of how I could be wrong with the whole, all of this, this branch up here represents <sighs> Megalosauroidea. Big words. <sighs> Depending on your research and what phylogenetic trees you can find online, you can place this branch here like I did, or you can place it here as a sub-branch of Allosauroidea. And up here, you can see that there's a place for a branch that I just straight up omitted to place on this tree altogether. That actually represents all the theropods not classified into Neotheropoda like Herrerasaurus. Loads of room for improvement, but I'm no expert in the field, and I'm extremely lazy. This contains every theropod dinosaur in some form or fashion, and the majority of them do not matter. Our major focus is going to be here, in Tetanura, at the split between Allosauroidea and Silurosauria. Just so we are all on the same page here, each and every one of these branches represents significant evolutionary divergences. If we were to use this as a substitute for our own phylogenetic tree, our split from chimpanzees wouldn't even get us out of this branch way the heck down here. Tetanura contains most of the theropod dinosaurs that you would be familiar with. There's exceptions to that, like, you know, Dilophosaurus up here and the Ceratosaurus here. But for the most part, this is where you would look to find them. Now, if we were wanting to find the placement of an animal that I clearly said was related to Allosaurus earlier, where would you be looking? Well, somewhere in this branch, Allosauroidea, which is named for Allosaurus. Go figure. 
The earliest members of this group appeared in the early parts of the Middle Jurassic, somewhere around 174 million years ago. This is also around the same time that we can definitively place the split between these two groups, although some fossil evidence puts that split even earlier in the Triassic. To put some perspective on the sheer time difference that we're talking about, if we condense this down to a time scale of human history, that split either happened when the Americas first had interactions with Europeans in 1492, or at the founding of Rome in 753 BC. The point is that this split is either old or extremely old in comparison to the animals that we're talking about. Which, you know, if you're looking at it, all the splits that get us here to Tyrannosaurus makes them so distantly related that you wouldn't really see them as being family members. They're kind of like cats and dogs at that point. Sure, they're technically related, but on a long enough timeline, everything is. So this segment is Cacarodontosauridae. In here is where we find Acrocanthosaurus, alongside all of its closest relatives. This clade is named for Cacarodontosaurus, which is actually amongst the latest living members of this group. Not the latest, but pretty close to the end of the Cretaceous. Giganotosaurus was closer to the end of the lineage, but you know, I'm digressing. All of the animals here are extremely similar. I mean, they're all pretty similar to everything in Allosauria in general, but these guys are even more similar. Narrow skulls that have subtle differences, three-fingered forearms that are fairly strong and flexible, and a general body plan that suggests that they all filled similar niches in their lives. You know, speaking of those arms, you all know how a, a T-Rex had those extremely tiny little arms that, you know, compared to the rest of its body, when, when you look at theropods, it's a fairly common trait that their arms are proportionally small to their bodies. In the case of the ceratosaurs, and especially the abelosauridae, their arms are almost completely vestigial. In some cases, their arms are theorized to have just, you know, been absorbed straight into the overall structure of their torso. Kind of like, you know, with whales and, you know, their hind limbs. In both Tyrannosaurs and Allosaurs, their arms actually stop growing after a certain point. Up until they reach adulthood, their arms are proportional with the rest of their bodies. With T-Rex, this starts sooner and they end up being those dainty little things that are only ever really useful in grasping. But with Allosaurs, their arms are still incredibly useful in both grasping and as a means of attacking. They are still extremely muscular arms. It's, you know, kind of like someone that you can tell skipped out on arm day a few times too many, but you're not going to tell them that because you saw them bench press 500 pounds. There's a lot of evidence that tells us that Acrocanthosaurus and most of the Allosaurus still use their arms to hunt, but, you know, that isn't just coming from, you know, like, muscular attachments and, you know, the fact that they're significantly larger than T-Rex's arms. You know, no, it actually comes from those tiny, narrow skulls of theirs. When you compare their skull to a T-Rex, you notice a huge difference. T-Rex had a large skull with a lot of bone and muscle attachment points. This is to make sure that it had a huge bite force and a skull that would withstand the impact of it. That suggests that its primary means of attacking is through that bite. Kind of like how a great white shark relies on one singular bite to finish off its prey. With Acrocanthosaurus, it would still have a large bite force, but its skull doesn't have the shape or structure to withstand being the only means of attack. So having those powerful and flexible arms to be able to attack up close while you know, holding its target with with its mouth becomes a necessary component of its hunting strategy. I think I got off track just a little bit. So, how is Acrocanthosaurus from North America related to Giganotosaurus of South America and even Cacarodontosaurus from Northern Africa? That's because during the Jurassic, when the early members of Allosauroidea first showed up, the world looked something like this. This image, by the way, is taken from an interactive map of the world throughout time. There will be a link to it in the description. 
During this time period, North America, South America, Africa, and even parts of Europe were all connected to each other, which, if you didn't know, makes it incredibly easy for landlocked species to traverse across what would eventually become isolated continents. These early members of the clade would spread across all four continents and eventually evolve into the animals that we're talking about now. And that connection between at least Africa and the Americas would continue until the early Cretaceous when they would finally start to break apart and you'd start to see the major diversification between the species of Allosauroidea. When you're talking about dinosaurs, you know, one of the things that really come up very big is how they looked. And when you're talking about how they looked, an even bigger question is, did they have feathers? But not all dinosaurs had feathers. Could you just imagine brontosaurus with feathers? Actually, thinking about that, that would actually be pretty sick. Anyways, that intrusive thought aside, there's a lot of evidence for feathers and proto-feathers in dinosaurs, but not all of them had them. As far as I can tell, true feathers are only ever really seen inside of theropod dinosaurs. Birds and the dromaeosaurs are probably what come to mind the quickest, but most of the Manoraptorans had them, and there's even evidence for them to exist in T-Rex uh, due to other relatives having them in spades. For Acrocanthosaurus, though, it's a bit of a shot in the dark. The remains for the animal itself doesn't have any suggestions that it had feathers or even protofeathers, but there are some distantly related animals that may have suggested having feathers or protofeathers as a basal condition to Allosauroidea, and even further back, it's possible that it's basal to the whole of Theropoda. Concavenator. Look at that word. How's that? Concavenator. Concavenator. Uh, uh. <clears throat> Conca Concavenator. Concavenator. <clears throat> Concavenator is nestled within Cacarodontosauridae, and it's more basal than Acrocanthosaurus. It has suggestions of feather-like attachments on its arms, so it's not completely unreasonable to include them in reconstructions of Acrocanthosaurus. But it's also just as likely to have a leathery skin with sparse scales and dermal ossifications. Those are the hard, bumpy things that are on the skin for reptiles. And... The easiest answer is that we just don't know. But that easy answer also ignores a lot of the evidence that we do have, like scale impressions and the aforementioned feather-like attachment points. And I, I think that'll do it for this video about my favorite dinosaur. You'll have noticed that I talked almost as much, if not more, about dinosaurs that weren't Acrocanthosaurus. And that's because, like most subjects, dinosaurs aren't a linear topic. Research into one species will influence the research of another, and so on and so forth. And that's not just limited to extinct ones. The more we know about sharks, birds, and otters, the more we can learn about the extinct animals like T-Rex, Acrocanthosaurus, and Kylosaurus, name a saber-toothed tiger or extinct mammal. And that's because living animals help us understand how extinct ones living in those exact same ecological niches or using those same mo motives of locomotion, hunting, etc. would have behaved or how they would have done similar tasks and what kind of challenges they would have faced in comparison to the modern animals due to their differences. And that's why there have been some references to modern animals here and there. So let's end this off with a question that I'm sure you're dying to answer. What's your favorite dinosaur? Let me know down below and perhaps it'll, you know, inspire me to make another video talking about it and the cool things that we have learned about the animals that are related to it. And if you've enjoyed this video, why not click on this one here to help the channel? Anyways, I'll see you next time. Okay. You gotta get like a million of the river.